Chris Peak here. Peaks here with Lucas Wilder uh, back with me again tonight. I've missed Lucas over the past month. Uh, get some school stuff done. Um, I think we're going to talk about the uh, the forts tonight on the Tennessee River. Uh, Lucas, how are you, man? Thanks for coming back. I am beat to death. I have been I have been ran all around this world getting my dissertation put together and we're going to be defending on March 23rd. Uh, hopefully I receive my doctorate and graduate on May 13th from Mississippi State University. So I have been run ragged. Uh, that's one reason me and you have been able to do a lot of recording is I have been writing chapters, finalizing chapters. And as I was telling you earlier tonight, I'm going to be putting them all into one document and sending them off to the committee so that they can read it and then they can uh, you know, bust me up over it when March 23rd comes around. How long did it take you to get this uh, doctorate? Uh, well, 13 years uh, it's taken f in college, that is. Uh, my entire college career, I uh, two years for the associates, two years for the bachelors, two years for the master's, so that's six. And then I've been in my PhD program since 2014. And so it's taken about about eight years uh, total, almost eight years to get the doctorate, um, just, just doing the doctorate work. Um, so when you get done, I know we talked earlier or one time you uh, got turned down for a teaching position. Is, is teaching what you want to do or writing books or you know, what's Lucas want to do? Yeah, teaching is what I'm what, what I love to do and what I, I think I'm passionate about. And the students seem to like me because I still te I teach at the college level as an adjunct, but I'd love to do a full time position. There's actually two that's opened up at a local university that I do adjunct work for. I'm hoping to get those one of those two jobs that just opened up. One of them is for an Appalachian historian and the other is for a Civil War historian, which I do both Appalachian history and Civil War history. So I think I'm a pretty good fit either way. So hopefully we c I can get one of those jobs. I hope you do get that. Uh, so you teach you teach like the 100, 200 level classes right now? I teach early U.S. history, modern U.S. history. I teach a class all about Abraham Lincoln. So, hey, I get to talk about Civil War in depth in that class. And I also have taught a civics class. So how Americans uh, can view citizenship, democracy, uh, the democratic republic that we have created for ourselves. And so I go into the Constitution, the Declaration, Declaration of Independence. And so I talk basic politics in that class, just how we established our political system and how people can become more civically involved and become better citizens themselves. Well, I'll be good, man. It's like, you know, I have a great teacher, so. Well, further ado, now, this is uh, one of my favorite subjects right here when we talk about the uh, defending the Mississippi River. I've made this argument countless times, uh, and some people see my argument, and others argue, you know, still fight me on it. To me, this right here is one of the turning points in the Civil War. Um, I don't know why the Confederacy decided to put a static river defense against the mobile army and gunboats. Um, you know, when, when these two forts fell in, in uh, New Orleans, the river was worthless. I mean, so why did the Confederacy think this would work? I mean, because they felt like dominoes. It is. This is the domino effect, and this is the beginning of the end of the of the Confederacy in the West. Um, the Western theater is not the, it will no longer be the same after the battles of Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. Well, the Confederate high command sought to defend the extremely long border between Kentucky and Tennessee. It's a very long border and Kentucky declares its neutrality. So this seems like it's going to work out perfect for the Confederacy because if Kentucky has declared neutrality, then no one can, then the United States troops can't come into the state and invade Tennessee from there. Seems like a good plan. We find out that's not going to happen, happen the way that the Confederacy wants. Uh, various commanders took command of the western border, uh, but one of the more inexperienced commanders who obtained significant command was Leonidas Polk. I've done an entire biography series on him, so if you want something in-depth on him, just check my videos that I did for him. Uh, Polk was supposed to defend the Mississippi River, and in doing so, he, he had first took command of some troops around Memphis. He invades Kentucky. This violates Kentucky's neutrality. 
Kentucky as citizens are like, what are you doing? And he goes and occupies Columbus, Kentucky, hoping to defend the Mississippi River at this point. Um, this upset the Confederate President Jefferson Davis. Um, he wanted Kentucky to come into the Confederate fold, become a Confederate state, but he wanted it done very delicately. He didn't want to press the issue. He wanted Kentucky to come over naturally because if you try to force them, it's not going to it's not going to be pretty. He didn't think uh, once Kentucky was invaded, other Confederates began moving into the state. So not only did Polk move into the state, um, but um, Felix Zollicoffer, who commands the Department of East Tennessee on the other side of Tennessee, invaded Kentucky at Cumberland Gap. And when Zollicoffer invades, Albert Sidney Johnston, who's took, taken command of the Western Theater, would place a bunch of troops also in uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky. Now, Kentucky itself, by the end of the war, will supply roughly 80,000 troops for the Union and about 20,000 for the Confederacy. The hopeful the secessionist mentality that Jefferson Davis envisioned Kentucky having did not materialize. They were very much more pro-Union than they were pro-Confederate, which spelled even worse disaster for them. Um, the defensive line for the Confederacy, and this is the most critical defensive line the Confederacy has and the longest one they have. It runs from Bowling Green, uh, from, from Columbus to Bowling Green and from Bowling Green to Cumberland Gap, and it constituted the Confederate hopes of defending Tennessee from invasion. Uh, Polk to the West would have run-ins with an up to uh, with with an up-and-coming commander named Ulysses S. Grant, who we all know, and Grant was already demonstrating his skill with coordinating infantry with steamboats by this point. Uh, between Columbus and Bowling Green was the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers. Uh, waterways were the major highways of the 19th century, so to protect Nashville and the rest of Tennessee. State officials had ordered the building of two forts, uh, Fort Henry on the Tennessee River and Fort Donelson on the Cumberland River. Um, they were constructed by Brigadier General of Tennessee Militia Daniel Donelson. He named Donelson after himself, and he named Henry at a, after Gustavus Adolphus Henry Jr., a Tennessee senator. Uh, Henry uh, Fort Henry was placed in a low-lying, swampy area with the high ground opposite it on the west bank of the river. So it's not placed in a good situation, although it had about a two mile vision of the river so they could attack boats as they were coming up and down the river. This was not supposed to be a fort that you could withstand an infantry assault. This was simply something to stop traffic going up and down the Tennessee River. Uh, Henry was placed on the east bank and Donaldson was placed on the west bank so that one garrison could actually move in between the forts, which is only 12 miles apart, even they're on two separate rivers. Um, and so one garrison, I mean, one troop, two garrisons, or one set of troops, two garrisons. And Donaldson was in a much better position, um, but Henry's was not prepared in the least for a land-based attack. Um, Johnston, Albert Sidney Johnston, ordered Polk to support Fort Henry and actually construct some fortifications on the opposite bank. Since he's on the opposite bank of the, of the Tennessee River, try to build some fortifications, support Fort Henry, but Polk fails to do so. And this uh, Albert Sidney Johnston, who has been friends with Polk since their days at West Point, is very irritated at the lack of initiative that Polk has demonstrated. To make things worse, so we've got the Confederate defensive line have kind of set the stage uh, from Columbus to Fort Henry and Fort Donelson, then go to Bowling Green, and then we move further east to Cumberland Gap. That's the defensive line. Uh, around Cumberland Gap, there's been a Confederate force under Felix Zollicoffer. He's made his first invasion of Kentucky in September of 1861. He goes up to London, Kentucky, where he is soundly defeated by Albin Schopf. A Union general who originally was from Austria-Hungary gets uh, picks the wrong side in the Austria-Hungarian War and has to flee to Turkey. Who takes who teaches artillery at an artillery academy in Turkey and then eventually goes to the United to United States to Washington D.C. gets a desk job, but he has this military experience and is thrown into the situation when the war breaks out. He's got military experience. They make him a general, and he defeats Felix Zollicoffer at the Battle of Camp Wildcat. Um, Zollicoffer 
moves back into East Tennessee, licks his wounds, and then makes another assault. Not on, not, not entirely his doing. It was General Crittenden, uh, General Carroll, and himself invaded Kentucky uh, through uh, Big Creek Gap and went up to the battle, what emerges as the Battle of Mill Springs. And so on January 19th, that battle was fought of 1862, uh, where Zollicoffer fought against George Thomas and it was this damaged the defensive line of the eastern front of the western theater um, that army that confederate army was destroyed well not destroyed it was badly badly maimed they had to move back into tennessee and there goes the right flank of the defensive line so johnston is already concerned at this point and uh, just a little bit later right after the battle of mill springs henry halleck the commander in the western theater for the union forces approves for ulysses s grant to move against fort henry um, which he did in early february so uh, i'll kind of take a break there do you have any questions so far these uh forts uh just so people know how, how big were they like how much uh, space did they encompass or the land they take up uh, actually uh, uh, good thing you brought it up i'm uh just getting ready to talk about that um uh, I, I have a quite a bit of information on fort henry just because i feel it's important to know the geographical situation of it to understand why the battle happened the way it did uh henry is not uh, is a fairly good size fort it's got 17 guns at its placement um, it sits um about 20 feet above the river and under normal levels, it's about 20 feet above the river, above the water line. Um, but there was heavy rains in February and late January of 1862. And so the river had risen actually above the fort. And so much of Fort Henry is actually underwater when the battle is getting ready to take place and including the powder magazine. Um, if you get a chance, to go to Fort Fort Donelson, it's a fairly large. Uh, when we say Fort Donelson, most people when they think of Fort Donelson, they only think about the um, the water batteries, which is the first thing that comes to mind. Um, but there was an even larger uh, series of entrenchments that go further out. Um, if you're just talking about the immediate area of the water batteries, I don't know the exact acreage, but you're looking at probably about. Um, probably about 10 acres square, I would, I would suspect, of just the water battery part where there's guns fo focused on the Cumberland River. So, and there's huge guns there. Um, they're primed and ready to go at this point. Uh, and you may be fixed to touch on this too, uh, but I, I didn't want to forget it. Um, how hard is it, or how accurate are these guns coming against these boats? I mean, do they sink anything? Is it difficult to hit? Civil War artillery is, if you can get someone that's experienced with artillery, and by the end of the war, many of these artillery units are wonderful crack shots. Um, Fort, if you go to Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, they actually give a really good description. It's actually where I give get my description from, kind of tell people about Civil War artillery, is that depending on the gun, uh, I'm going to use the 20-pound Parrot rifle, which was one of the most heavily used weapons uh, for the Union, it and the 10 pounder. They could shoot about two miles accurately. And wow. from and from two miles away, they could hit an acre square 75% of the time. Oh. So think about that. That's really, really good. Um, this is not uh, shooting it and hoping it hits something. No, you're getting it pretty darn close. And when we talk about Fort Donelson, um, that becomes uh, evident that the conf uh, Civil War artillery is much more advanced than people give it credit for, especially when we get to the rifled guns. And those are amazing. Um, that's what nullifies any um, stone forts. And while I'm on it, let's just talk about it. Uh, if you go to Fort Pulaski in Savannah, Georgia, you'll notice that Fort Pulaski is a stone, a masonry fort. Now, if you shoot cannon, this fort, I'll probably off on a date, but it's somewhere around the 1830s was when it was either started or finished. It was this fort, 30s and four, uh, maybe 40s, 1840s. The cannons of that period 
were des- uh, it was with- it was built to withstand the cannons of that period, and it could. You could throw cannonballs at it all day from these smoothbore um, Napoleons. It's not going to cause much of a dent in these masonry forts. However, when you shoot a thirty-pound par- uh, thirty-pound parrot rifle with a conical bullet that weighs thirty pounds, it actually will dent in and create a hole in these forts. And so it, the parrot rifle or the rifled cannon, which it could be a thirty-three inch ordnance rifle, either one, nullifies the use of masonry forts um, because they just don't stand up. What can stand up against these uh, heavy artillery is earthworks, which is what Fort Donelson and Fort Henry are made out of. You can't. It's they don't have enough time to build masonry forts, but they find out that it actually works better if they have earthworks rather than masonry forts. Hey, let me ask you one other question. Um, you, and I don't know if you're familiar with this fort or not, but in Pensacola, Fort Pickens, that's a masonry sort of fort. You, Cor- you, correct, and it's a sister fort, too. And I, when I say sister fort, they were built roughly the same time by many of the same engineers who built the other ones. Yeah. Um, fort Pickens, Fort Sumter, yeah. Fort Monroe, and Fort Pulaski, and a host of others. Yeah, I went down there a couple of years ago. I mean, that thing is just huge. I mean, that, mm-hmm. I was amazed at how big it was. Mm-hmm. But sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, you're good. Um, now, Brigadier General Lloyd Tilgman uh, was in command of Henry. And when Grant steamed up the Tennessee River, he deployed his infantry at two locations to try to um, take, over it by, take it over by land and by water. Uh, but the gunboats were able to actually drive off the limited artillerymen at the fort. Um, the rest of the force, the, the majority of the force, had actually left and already went to Fort Donelson. Uh, there were, for Fort Henry, there was a bombardment of it of, that lasted a little over an hour. Um, the USS Sussex was, or USS Essex was hit, and the boiler and uh, hot boiling steam covered ha- about half the ship. There were a few casualties, uh, but Fort Henry surrendered on February 6th fairly easily. Um, you can't really do anything when your fort is nearly engulfed in water, so wow. not too not too many casualties. It surrenders pretty easily. Is there any and, assault on it? No, no infantry assaults. Um, the infantry, uh, the gunboats were able to force it to surrender before any major union, uh, any major land forces ever engaged. So how many uh, troops stayed from that fort? How many troops could the fort fit or how many were so there? We, yes, how many actually surrendered from there? Uh, I'm trying to think. We had a few thousand um, troops that actually left um, and went to Fort Donelson. Um, let's see. Because um, most of it, what was left was uh, mainly artillerymen. Um, I think it was a... Uh, actually, I don't know. I don't know right off the top of my head how many exactly surrendered right after... Uh, during the battle. Um, it, like I said, I, most, of the tro- most of the troops were gone and went to Fort Donelson kind of uh, trying to there is no hope trying to say it. It's not trying to say Fort Henry with it being engulfed in water. Um, I'm just looking up right quick, looking at um, um, American Battlefield Trust and seeing what they say here. Um, looks like about 100 men, I guess. Something like oh. that. <laughs> uh, surrender officially. I think that's what they have listed here. So, yeah, so what? not that not that many uh, uh, that surrender, but a few thousand were there before the uh, the attacks began. Um, so a few days later, um, Grant is bent on tackling Fort Donelson. Fort Henry fell pretty pretty quickly quickly, so why not tackle Fort Donelson? Uh, Grant starts moving his land forces across land. Um, to Fort Donelson. Again, they're only 12 miles away, so it's not going to take long. Then he moves and he moves the flotilla. They steam down the Tennessee and then up the Cumberland River. Um, again, it's only 12 miles away by land, but it's quite a long distance. They have to go all the way down to the Ohio, then back up into uh, up the up the Cumberland. Um, 
they engage with the artillery on the water batteries. Um, now, altogether, Grant has mustered somewhere around 25,000 men after his reinforcements get there. Um, and this is counting the men on the ironclads. Uh, the Confederacy had four prominent commanders at Donelson. Uh, John B. Floyd, he was actually the Secretary of War under James Buchanan just the year before for the United States. Um, he did not have the military experience needed to command Donelson, but he was the overall commander there. Uh, Gideon Pillow, he had fought in the Mexican-American War, but was by far more of a politician than a commander. Um, Bushrod Johnston, uh, Bushrod Johnson, a he was a West Point graduate, a veteran of the Mexican-American War. He's probably one of the more capable, able-bodied Confederate commanders there. And then we have Simon Bolivar Buckner, another West Point trained veteran of the Mexican-American War, and he he kind of rounded out the Confederate High Command, by far Buckner and Johnson were better commanders and more capable of defending the defending the location. Um, although it does need to be mentioned that Nathan Bedford Forrest was there, um, but he had not gained the rank or the clout that he would in the future. So we don't, I'll, I'll mention him, but he's not one of these overall commanders of the area. Yeah, and we have, we have a little over about 15,000 men somewhere around that of Confederate forces at Fort Donelson. Um, well, you know, uh, it's, it's probably good for the um, borderers that Forrest hadn't achieved that rank because he himself would have been able to fight off that attack. Uh. Uh, we'll, we'll get there, <laughs> but yeah, he was, he, was, he was very adamant in his opinions about what was happening at Fort Donelson. I know some people, uh, if you listen to them, that, Far single handedly won every battle, and if he'd been at Gettysburg, he would have won that battle by himself. <laughs> I like, Guys, um, I have to argue all the time. You know, if you listen, Forrest won you know, everything by himself. So I was making a little joke there. <clears throat> uh, I have a professor who grew up in Memphis, and oh, he said he said when he was. Uh, going to school that he they taught the Civil War that Nathan Bedford Forrest won the Civil War but allowed the Yankees to take over anyway you know he was he was that that's it was a joke but that's how high up they placed him around Memphis Uh, but but on February 14th we see the the major assault that happens at Fort Donelson Uh, Grant's naval forces attack the water batteries at Donelson and they were sent back down river. I mean, you you can you should look at the different uh, how many hits that the Confederate battery had against the the Grant's Brown Water Navy, that flotilla that attempted to capture Fort Donelson, just like they had at Fort Henry. You think that his gunboats could do the job, but the Confederate Confederate artillery was so accurate that they sent the gunboats back down the river. They couldn't handle it. They were, they were hit so many times. I mean, it's just, just amazing of what, what, how I remember what I said. If you had a good artillery crew, man, it was hard for them to miss sometimes. And just different circumstances lead you to how to, um, um, See, so, yeah, you know that some battles were affected pretty drastically by bad artillerymen, or at least where artillery shells don't work properly. Um, but in this case, this demonstrates the power that the art- uh, con- that artillery, whether it's Confederate or Union, actually can perform. Uh, it's just mind-boggling how 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 amazingly accurate they were. And I bet that, and I'm not, of course, I don't not, not know what it looks like, but. Tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, that river and gunboats coming down it, they're kind of like, would they be kind of bottled up, like almost shooting fish in a barrel? Yeah, they're, they've got to come up only one way. And Fort Donaldson has all kinds of guns trained right on those those areas that are coming in. It's, it's, a, it's a just amazing. Um, there's a few statistics here that I was able to um, pull up. Um, of the, about the 500... Uh, the Confederates shoot about 500 shots of artillery against these ships. Uh, the St. Louis was hit 59 times. Uh, the uh, I can't pronounce the name, uh, Corin Delay, which uh, got hit 54 times. The Louisville got hit 36 times, and the Pittsburgh got hit 20 times. That's a pretty good ratio, especially for a semi-moving target. Um, so yeah, they they were able to drive the artillery 
uh, drive the gunboats back with just their artillery. So looking pretty good at this point. Um, but um, there were some light maneuverings uh, with the infantry. And once the flotilla was unable to budge Fort Donelson, um, Grant now knew that he needed to capture Donelson by land. And so there were some heated skirmishes, but the largest of the conflict uh, happened uh, on February 15th in the early morning when Gideon Pillow launched an attack against the Union right flank is where McClernand's division was. It was a successful attack, um, but when Pillow realized that John, uh, Bushrod Johnson wasn't supporting him like he thought he was, uh, the attack kind of fell apart and didn't uh, just started to peter out and the Union reinforcements that were brought brought in threw back the Confederates, but it was a really successful attack that, mo that morning. Uh, the Southerners were now in the same state that they were in before and Grant in his nor normally aggressive fashion uh, counterattacked, captured some important fortifications and his men prepared for an assault the next morning. Uh, the evening of the 15th saw a council of a council of war where the Confederate leaders met to discuss what would happen next. Um, Floyd was actually scared. Uh, John B. Floyd was scared that if he was captured, that the United States would punish him because as secretary of war, he may or may not have had helped the South in their secession actions and may or may not have funneled supplies to them. And so he's scared that if he gets captured by Union forces, that they will you know, put him on trial for his actions as Secretary of War the year before. So he decided to leave out with his Virginia troops on the only steamship available, and they steam back up the Cumberland River. So he abandons the place. He hands over command to Gideon Pillow. Uh, Gideon Pillow decides he does not want to stay and surrender, and he escapes in a in a little boat uh, across the Cumberland River and escapes back towards uh, um, the he main left. Confederate forces heading east. Did he just abandon his troops? Say it again. Just abandon his soldiers. Uh, essentially, he he hands over command to Simon Bolivar Buckner. So there's been two successions of uh, of commanders for the Confederates. Uh, first, uh, uh, first Floyd, he he just he takes his troops with him and goes back up the Cumberland River, hands it over to Pillow. Pillow says, "I don't want to be here," and he hands over command to Buckner, who's the next in command. And so it's Simon Bolivar Buckner and Forrest. That are left and Forrest said that he did not come here to surrender and he led his cavalry uh, through kind of a swampy area just east of Fort Donelson and didn't encounter any Union forces and made it all the way back to Nashville safely. So hey, let me ask you a question, because uh, sure. the, the attack started uh, uh, you know, it was initially successful. Now, their troops were outside the fort or this was all going, how did, what was the troops lined up at uh, when this attack was going on? What the Confederates did was they kind of swung out to the left of their fortifications. So, yes, they were out of their fortifications, but they're trying to push back the Union forces uh, for a couple of reasons. One, just hopefully you actually launch a successful attack and can damage the Union forces enough for them to pull back, maybe. But the other one is they were going to try to break out. Hopefully they could cut their way through to a large enough portion um, that they could open up an escape route for other troops. That was the idea. Okay, here was my problem. I was thinking, I was still caught up thinking of picturing a masonry fort instead of fortifications. Now, I, now I can see it clear what you're talking about. Yes, it's just earthworks, and I highly recommend going to Fort Donaldson. It's a very well preserved battlefield, and once you go there, you can really understand what they're going through. And I absolutely love Fort Donaldson. I went twice in one year just because I liked visiting it and seeing the artillery. Uh, I'm an artillery fanatic. I love studying the cannons. I'll put them on the list. Um, yeah, please do. It's not too far from you either. It's just on the other side of Tennessee from you. Yeah, that's right. It's not that far from me. No. No, oh, okay. Um, the next morning, uh, it's, it's just Buckner and uh, about 13,000 Union forces, or Confederate forces there at Fort Donaldson. And Buckner will send a note to Grant. Um, they, Grant and Buckner knew one another. They had been comrades in arms in the United States Army for a while, and Buckner had actually gave Grant some money to make it back to his family who had, um, he was, 
Grant and Buckner were in California and Grant's family was back east. And so Buckner gave him some money to get back home when Grant resigned his commission uh, in the United States Army. He asks, uh, sends a note to Grant asking to discuss terms of surrender. And Grant's reply became famous because he said, Sir, years of this date proposing armistice and appointment of commissioners to settle terms of capitulation is just received. No terms except unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. And with that, um, Grant uh, Buckner will come to the, well, there is no negotiation table, but in the, <laughs> to use a turn of phrase, comes to the negotiation table and surrenders to Ulysses S. Grant. And Grant will forever be known because his initials are U.S. Grant, will be forever known as Unconditional Surrender Grant. Uh, Buckner would surrender 12,000 Confederate, uh, 12, 13,000 Confederate troops at Fort Donelson. Uh, the capture of Donelson started the domino effect for the Confederacy and the Cumberland River. Once Donelson is captured, that allows the flotilla to would allow the flotilla to go all the way to Nashville. And so the capital had to be evacuated and the Confederate forces at Columbus and Bowling Green would all move to northern Alabama, northern Mississippi, um, most famously concentrating around Corinth, Mississippi where Albert Sidney Johnston will start calling on troops from all around the Western theater, and eventually he'll get his force that will fight at the Battle of Shiloh. But it's all stems from them being unable to contain the Cumberland and Tennessee rivers on Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. Uh, a couple questions. Um, sure. and this one probably is just a uh, you know, guess, guess, uh, putting yourself in my shoes, well, you know what's what's he thank you, man? Because he don't know if he he says unconditional surrender. He don't know if he's going to be hung for this. He doesn't, and that's kind of a weird situation for Confederate soldiers as the war begins, because and technically they are committing treason. And when you commit treason against the United States, take up arms against the United States, they have, you know, a constitutional right to execute you for um, bringing up, bringing, uh, raising arms against the United States. Lincoln, and if it was a normal rebellion, I think that probably would have been done. But Abraham Lincoln did not want to do that. He, Abraham Lincoln had a reconciliation mindset from the early beginnings of the war that they are not going to be treated as rebels would normally be treated um, they institute the prisoner of war uh, kind of a prisoner of war system even though Lincoln did not want to recognize them as a nation which that's the reason you would take them as prisoners of war otherwise you could just get rid of them you could um, execute them right there but it's because of Abraham Lincoln and his mentality towards the South. And by this point, I th think it's pretty evident that that's how it's going to be. Um, have, Buckner may have been a little concerned, but I don't think too much um, by that point. Maybe in the early, early stages, but by by early 62, that was not a concern. Okay. Um, the next one, uh, I touched on this earlier, and probably a better discussion when we get the expert there too. I've made this argument, I said countless times, I said that was the biggest waste of manpower trying to defend that system. They lost 100,000 men and 282 guns. You know, save your forces, survive in advance. That, that could have done a whole lot more in the field than trying to hold on to those, those forts. Well... I understand the reasoning for Fort Donelson, Fort Henry, uh, because of Columbus, Bowling Green, and Cumberland Gap. Uh, that is your biggest front. Um, Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, which would happen later in that year of 62 when Lee takes command of that army, he doesn't have to defend that wide of a front. It's maybe 100 miles wide from what he has to defend. And that's pretty easy with such a large force as he had. The Confederates in the West do not have that large of a force, at least not concentrated, not in the West. And they're having to defend something that is near four or five times wider than the Eastern Theater is. So naturally, you're going to want to defend the major waterways because if you don't, 
then the flotillas can come up and invade at any point and they can launch troops at any location. It's just too risky not to. Since you have Polk at Columbus, Kentucky, he can watch the Mississippi River. Um, he, I don't, they've actually put a big tra chain across the river to keep any boats from going up and down at it. it works to some varying degrees. Um, so you have him on the Mississippi, you have Fort Henry Donaldson uh, on the Ten uh, Tennessee and Cumberland rivers, and then you've got the major points of Bowling Green and then Cumberland Gap, some major invasion routes. I understand the, the mentality towards it. It's a good mentality, especially when you don't have that many troops. Um, but it, I think it goes to geographically. The Western theater had a much harder time defending itself than the Eastern theater. Yeah, I mean, I, sorry, go ahead. I understand it too, but you also made this point to somebody one time. I said, uh, you know, what is the outcome of every fort that's man? <laughs> they surrender. You know, they fall uh, throughout history. Um, it's going to get captured eventually. Well, Vicksburg gets captured, um, but they're. That's the kind of the last vestige. You you don't like yeah. that it's the kind of left on its own, but you kind of got to. Um, I understand that there's uh, many of the there's lots of supplies coming in, uh, sugar that's coming across from Louisiana, still coming across around Vicksburg. You've got uh, cattle coming in from Texas. Um, cool. Is it worth holding on to Vicksburg? Um, that's that's something we can debate. Um, but I think to them. And as it bears out in history, it was very important to them. They understood it being a lifeline that they needed to have communication as well as connection with that half of the Confederacy. See, my, and we'll get into it more when it gets there. But I look at it, by the time, you know, when uh, what's Henry and Dawson fell and New Orleans was gone, Mississippi River, then it, there's nothing getting out. I look at it as, as, as worthless. I mean, I don't know how much what well, you said the sugar and cattle and you you know more than I do. I mean, how much was actually getting across that river from because with Arkansas and Louisiana, most of it had already fallen, and for it to get across that river and then grant then how far is it going to go? I mean, is it going to make it all the way to Virginia? Um, and then the other thing I look at to me, Vicksburg reminds me of uh, almost like Stalingrad. It comes down to a, an ego thing. They just wouldn't going to let it go. Oh. Then let me ask you this question. Where are you going to fall back to? If, if, I'm not, gonna... if not Vicksburg, where in Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee are you going to fall back to? I would think that the first spot, the first, now, and back up here, I, the first thing that I would have done, or in fact, we'd be looking at done, is get out of uh, Vicksburg and link up with jo uh, Johnson and Johnson and um, Jackson. Okay, then what are you going to do after you get, uh, you've got Jackson, but now you've got a Union Army you're going to have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with um, in the field. Yeah, and he would have had 45,000 troops. I know Grant would have had 80,000, 80, 85,000, but I would rather take my chances out in the field with those guns as opposed to locked into a fort. Uh, Polk does something really um for all the bad things Leonidas Polk ever did militarily, he actually did something decently well when after the Vicksburg campaign. So Vicksburg's captured by Union forces. William Tecumseh Sherman is kind of doing his trial run for his march to the sea when he marches from Vicksburg towards Meridian, Mississippi. Yeah. And when he's moving across the state, um, Polk will have Stephen D. Lee's cavalry kind of pick away at the sides, make him concentrate on just one road or at least limited amount of roads. So you're con making him concentrate and then you fight a battle of, um, you you fall back, you fight a battle, fall back, not very heavy engagements, but you're just going to wear them down. Make sure that they, uh, I think that's a pretty good strategy, but that's a similar strategy to Joseph E. Johnston uh, at, at Atlanta and people criticize him incredibly over that. Um, but I think it's a good strategy in that case, especially when you have a far superior army and you're have and they the enemy is having to march further inland and be further away from their base of operations. That's probably the best option to go with. Yeah, I thought being a strategy, and we've seen it work many times in Russia. Uh, 
I, I think by the time Johnson did it, or excuse, Johnson, did it, it was too late. Um, it, you, you, were, you were hoping to bank on a, it's, uh, you know, a, a political victory at the polls, and uh, that, that was just like a pie in the sky kind of hope, giving up that you know, thinking Lincoln, even if Lincoln lost, McClellan never said he was going to um, end the war. He said he was going to prosecute or differently. And Lincoln wouldn't have left office until March of 1865. That would have been like the Allies making peace with Nazi Germany at the beginning of April 1865. And uh, little, little Mike, with his ego, he would have probably taken the oath of office at Petersburg in full military uniform. Well, one another thing to think about is when you're doing this fallback strategy is the morale of the troops. If, if you're constantly moving back, the troop morale can get bogged down. We see this on a, during a lot of um, stationary combat where you're either like at Vicksburg or Petersburg, where these men are entrenched for long periods of time, their morale goes down uh, considerably. And so we have lots of high desertion rates. And so not only are you just delaying time, you're also hurting your army, but also attacking the enemy and getting beat is going to lower your morale as well. So you have a weird, I don't envy Johnson one bit, Johnston one bit. Johnston was in a pickle when he was trying to pull back towards Atlanta and Polk was doing similar things in Mississippi prior, uh, prior, just right after Vicksburg prior to the Atlanta campaign. So I think the geography of the Western theater hurt the Confederacy the worst is there's no good place to fall back. That's why I kept asking you, where do you fall back after this? And then after this, because there's no really great place geographically that you can funnel the Union troops to you and make them come to battle to you. Um, they're just going to invade and different multiple at various points throughout, especially because Grant uses technology to its greatest extent when he's using the, the gunboats. So uh, what can you do? You're, you're right. And I, I'm very hard on Johnson in Georgia. Uh, yeah, but, you know, he's fallback positions and then Florida Keys. Uh, uh, but I've often thought, you know, is when he gave up, I think, uh, 66 miles in 100 days or 100 miles in 66 days. I've got one like that. And I can't help but think, would Lee not have caught him somewhere, maneuvered, and, you know, caught Sherman out of place? Uh, you know, I don't know the, the northern Georgia landscape that much to see if there was a place that Johnson could have tried to maneuver with. Uh, of course, he wasn't, you know, that type of warrior. So I, I just can't have, I can't, I just can't see Lee falling back that far to Atlanta. And he commanded that army. Well, he did at Richmond, although he wasn't as falling. He, well, I, I, I'll take that back. He, he wasn't falling back to. Uh, defend himself as much as he was um, having to follow Grant, <laughs> trying to go around towards Rich, trying to get towards Richmond. Um, but Sherman was doing something very similar, so I don't know if uh, there are some good similarities between Johnston and Lee during the Overland campaign and the Atlanta campaign. So I'm not too exactly sure if uh, either one was doing the doing anything yeah. much different. I'm not sure what else you really, I mean, what else you really could have done uh, at that point. Um, yeah, but, yeah, but, for, but Fort Henry and Donaldson is, yeah. it's it's that tipping point. Um, it's, it's, if they could not defend that line at, uh, that ran across the border between Kentucky and Tennessee, it was not going to work. There was, that was one of their best defensive lines. It was a good defensive line in theory. Um, the geography is what beat them. Um, it was very difficult, and Grant's technology, uh, use of technology, that is. Um, but with the Red River campaign, New Orleans being taken, that's also going to be a factor, even if they do not, uh, if the Union does not penetrate in through Tennessee, um, the Mississippi River is slowly being taken away from the Confederacy. It might take a little bit longer, but it was slowly being taken away. You know, um, I, I don't know if you've ever looked at this, but I brought this up the other day on one of our military Mondays or something. I pointed this out. Uh, the Confederacy could have, and I, and I don't even know how, how the, uh, deep the rivers are widely is, but I was looking at the river systems coming out of Mobile in North Alabama, and it went all, from the Tennessee River went all, almost to Virginia. 
uh, you know, could, could they have utilized that river system more to their advantage as opposed to the Mississippi? The Union Army? No, the Confederacy. Um, they did to some extent. Um, okay. Well, um, actually, I know this very well because it runs right into my territory here. The Tennessee River begins basically at Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, its tributaries, one of the main ones being the Holston, uh, the Holston, the Clinch, the Powell, the Nolichucky, all those tributaries um, uh, start close to or in Virginia to some extent. And so let's take the Clinch River. Um, actually, uh, there's a gentleman, a farm, uh, not a farmer, he's a merchant that I've dug into his records and found out that he was floating wheat from his little store in Rogersville, Tennessee, down uh, to Knoxville and then on down the Tennessee River and all the way to down to New Orleans from there. Now, you could only do that at certain times of the year. The Clinch, Powell, Nolichucky, and the Holston are many times are not going to be able to withstand a large gunboat um, or a flotilla of gunboats. It's There might be a certain point of the year, but they run the risk of running aground if that happens. So I, you can't use that um, for okay, the that Confederacy. Makes, you couldn't use that for the Confederacy. Uh, makes, I didn't know how, how deep the rivers, you know, if they could have used them like the Mississippi. So uh, um, that, that was just... Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, I, didn't, I didn't really know um, about that. Thanks for letting me know. I thought maybe they might have been too uh, shallow because I can just tell when I went up there that at certain parts they do look thin. Yeah, and like I said, at some point, yeah, you might have been able to get a gunboat up up them at some time during the year, but it's not going to be the majority of the year. Um, and so that's going to you're going to risk uh, for the Union or the Confederacy trying to utilize those river systems. It, you're you're going to be running a big risk. But the Tennessee River, for quite a ways up all the way, uh, you can take the gunboats up the Tennessee River. Hey, this kind of might be off topic because it got me to thank you why they waited so long to take Mobile, but after New Orleans fell, did Mo, how much vital did Mobile become as far as the you know, port for the Confederacy? Did they like have a lot of stuff come in there, or you know, they waited until, you know, what, 1864 to take it? A lot of focus was on New Orleans and Charleston because okay. they, were the, they were the main uh, ports of entry to the Confederacy. Uh, they had already basically sealed off a lot of Virginia. Um, they were working on North Carolina. They pretty much sealed off Charleston, except for a few blockade runners. And New Orleans was captured pretty early. So Mobile became a main port. Now, I can't speak with any authority on how much was getting in or getting out. Um, but it, because the other places are cut off so much, it gains in importance. For the Confederacy, like I said, I can't speak on any, but with any authority on how much was coming in, but it gets more important because the other ones were cut off. I ask Jeff Johnston, who's a moderator of the group. And that's, I don't know if you're, are you a member of his uh, Navy groups? No, I'm not. No. That's really good uh, Navy groups. Uh, that okay, that brings up another good question to uh, touch on. Why, if, with New Orleans being so violent, what it was? Why did they basically put have skeletal defenses there and let them fall without taking a shot? I think that would probably be a, a good discussion for uh, later on because the Red River campaign and the capture of New Orleans is a it, it's a whole discussion in of itself. Okay. And then you got the then you got the occupation of New Orleans, which is another can of worms. We would probably have to do another issue, another episode for it. Yeah, I will, so I will set those up in the future. Um, so uh, let's see. Anything to add to this one? I think I've asked. Uh, uh, no, I think I think I'm think I've covered everything pretty accurate, uh, pretty pretty fully. All right, man. Um, we'll cut this. We'll talk for a second after this. Uh, and we'll um, I guess uh, couple, well, you probably will be busy, pretty busy over the next couple of weeks, right? I, I think I, I I should be. You know, done with the majority of the work um, after after this week. So, uh, if we if we want to try to schedule something for two weeks from today, um, we should be able to do that. Yeah, uh, what well, that'll be uh, late February. Uh, anything you want to do on that? Hmm. Let's see. I'm trying to think of anything that might have 
it might have might uh might be good discussion discussing them. I'm trying to think of any battle that happened in March other than the Battle of Cumberland Gap. <laughs> um not too much discussed there. Yeah, major battle I can't I can't think of uh, anything in March uh, when cut this. We'll talk off the record here. Um, 